All right, good morning, everybody. We're going to... We're going to get started this morning, and uh, I'm done to tell you I'm thankful to be here this morning. So we're going to do announcements, and then we're going to go a little further. Uh, this afternoon, uh, youth choir at 445. I know the bulletin says 5, but it's actually 445, so please keep that in mind. Uh, Wednesday night. July the 31st, there'll be a teen kid meeting after after the service Wednesday night. August the 3rd, back to school social at New Life, and that is for uh, grades 7 through 12 from 4 until 9 p.m. August the 4th is our brotherhood breakfast that morning at 8 a.m., and I believe Brother Ethan Jones will be the one speaking that morning, so if y'all know Brother Ethan Jones, please uh, please come out and support him. We'll be cooking at 7 and eating at 8. And then that night, we'll be having our back-to-school prayer meeting at 6 o'clock, and that'll be at the new gym at 5. And then August the 14th will be our teen kid kickoff at 6 o'clock. Anybody else have any other announcements this morning? All right. Anyone else? Anything else? All right. This morning. I want to share a couple of things from our Sunday school lesson this morning, and uh, I'll try to be real quick about this. I was talking about Asa and him going out and facing the army, the Ethiopian army, and they were uh, they were outnumbered two to one. So Asa prays to God and asks for his help, and uh, they defeat the, the Ethiopian army. And after the battle, it says a prophet was sent by the Spirit of God to Asa, and he reminded Asa and all the people that as long as long as they followed the Lord, he would be with them. If they sought God and would find him, but if they sought God, they would find him. But if they forsake God, forsook God, he would forsake them. Azira encouraged Asa and the people to be strong and not give up. God would reward them for their faithfulness. And then in another part of our lesson this morning, it said, uh, while God gives the victory, he still expects you to march into the battles with him by your side. So I'm sitting there this morning while Brother Gerald is doing our Sunday school lesson, and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, Brother Gerald brought out several good points. He said, you know, one of the first things he started off with, he said, us, as a, you know, our class, we're the senior adults up there. We don't need to get comfortable and say, well, there's not as much we can do for the Lord. So, you know, he says that, and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, God's telling us he doesn't want us to be on the defensive. He wants us to be on the offensive. He wants us to be going out and doing something. That's why I brought, brought my chair up here this morning. Um, and I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, you know, that's what we want to do a lot of times when we come to church. We're fulfilling our us to do. 
while God gives the victory, he still expects you to march into the battle. He didn't say sit there and let him fight the battle. He said, come along with me. Join by me. Hook up with me and let's go. And let's fight the battle. Depend on God's strength and might as you face each challenge. And when God brings the victory, let others know about it. Share your victories with your words and by your example. Be an encouragement to others as they face their own challenges and battles. Brother Gerald, Brother Larry, and Brother Winston. I thank you all here this morning for the example that you set for me. And I want to let you know how much I appreciate each other, each of you and what you do for God's kingdom and the men that y'all are. But this morning I want to share. I want to share my own personal victory. And I hope it can help someone in here today. I want to praise my Lord and my Savior for what he's blessed me with. 28 years ago, Friday, he gave me my help, mate. He gave me my life. The one that will pick me up. The one that will pray for me when I need it, when I'm struggling. The one that is always there by my side. And there's no way I'd be where I am today without her. Let me tell you how you win that battle. By hard work, by not being on the defensive, being on the offensive, always striving and trying and working hard, trying to do the things that would help each and every one of you. Always trusting in God that he's always going to get you through each one of those battles. Marriage is not an easy road. It's a lot of hard work. And you have to put in that hard work to get to where I'm at today, 28 years later. And I'm thankful that he blessed me with that this morning. That's my victory this morning. I hope some of you in here this morning have a victory that y'all can share with someone down the road that maybe it'll help them and be an encouragement to them. Brother Josh.
Big smile on your face, stand to your feet, and tell somebody you're glad to see them. Brother uh, Jason Dollar, if he would, to uh, open us in prayer.
morning. morning. Well, I've been scolded this morning already by young and old alike. (laughs) Miss Cat, Miss Dot, Miss Nancy, they've all done scolding me for not singing as much as I was. And then I come out and these kids right here, they get on me. So... (laughs) I'm just proud that I can serve the Lord through a song. This is a song that the kids ask for. I stood in the courtroom. The judge turned my way. It looks like you're guilty now what do you say I spoke of your honor I have no defense but that's when mercy walked in mercy That pleaded my case All to the stand Was God saving grace The blood was presented That covered my sin Forgiven when mercy How could this be someone so guilty had just been set free? My chains were broken, I felt born again the moment that mercy God saving grace, the blood was presented that covered my sin, forgiven when mercy. Forgiven when mercy walked in. Mm-hmm. All right, no, come on, come on. All you kids, come on. Y'all done it up young the other night, and y'all done a great job. Y'all, we're so fortunate to have some kids like this. And they love singing for the Lord, and it comes from their hearts. They asked me to do this song at Pumpkin Center the other night, and I said, all right, y'all just going to do it with me. And, I, and they, we well, never had practiced this song. They never had done it. But they got up there, and I said, from now on, y'all going to be doing it here, too. <laughs> While walking down a memory lane not so long ago, I walked along my way He 
Chapter 5, 1 John chapter number 5, uh, talked about last week about bringing you a series of dangers, uh, and, and this morning, with the Lord's help, we're going to preach what he's laid on our heart about the dangers in doubt, the dangers in doubt, and uh Hold your finger in 1 John chapter 5 and go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 2. And uh, we're going we're gonna to take these uh, two passages of scriptures and, and uh, we'll be preaching from them also tonight. And this, when we talk about doubt this morning, we're going to talk about uh, doubt and salvation. And tonight we're going to be talking about doubt and servanthood. And how dangerous it really is to doubt your salvation and how dangerous it is to doubt your servanthood. Uh, but it will come from Philippians 2 and John chapter 5. And, and while you're there, uh, I want to read to you a, a, a little excerpt of a message that was preached by Charles Haddon Spurgeon 
1862 on March the 16th, and it was named The Danger of Doubting. This is how he began. He said, To doubt the loving kindness of God is thought by some to be a very small sin. In fact, some have even exalted the doubts and fears of God's people into fruits and grace, an evidence of great advancement in experience. It is humiliating to observe that certain ministers have pampered and petted men in unbelief and distrust of God. Being in this false ma uh, fa in this matter false to their master and to the souls of his people. Far be it from me to smite the feeble of the flock, but their sins I must and will smite, since it is my firm conviction that to doubt the kindness, the faithfulness, the love of God is a, is a very heinous offense. Unbelief is akin to atheism. Atheism denies God's existence. Unbelief denies his goodness. And since goodness is essential to God, these doubts do in reality stab at the very being of who he is. That can be no light sin which makes God a liar. And yet unbelief does in effect cast foul and slanderous suspicion upon the veracity of the Holy One of Israel. That can be no small offense which charges the creator of heaven and earth with perjury. And yet if I mistrust his oath and will not believe his promise sealed by the blood of his own son, I count the oath of God to be unworthy of my trust. And so do I in very deed accuse the king of heaven as false to his covenant and oath. Besides, I shall uh, show this morning unbelief of God is the fountain of innumerable sins. As a, the black cloud is the mother of many raindrops, so dark unbelief is the parent of many crimes. And what if I should say that unbelief concentrates the vice of the ages into a moment and gathers up the virus of all offenses of the race into one transgression. I should not be far from the mark, but I should, uh, shall say no strong words in the preface uh, because, it, because of the incident in David's history uh, shall I bring uh, this morning and will by be in and of itself enough to lead to give your verdict, which is mine, that unbelief is a damnable sin and that it should be condemned by every believer and should be struggled against, should be, if possible, subdued, and certainly should be the object of our deep repentance and abhorrence. That was just the beginning part of, of what uh, Charles Spurgeon said about doubting. And so in that light, uh, I want you to rise out of reverence of the reading of God's holy and infallible word. And we're going to look at 1 John chapter 5. We're going to read two verses, verse 13 and 14. And, and then we'll flip over to Philippians 2, verse 12. It says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and verse 13, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is the will, it is, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Let's pray this morning. Father, God, we come to you, Lord, with thankful hearts. Lord, thanking you and praising you, uh, God, that we can have confidence in you this morning. And Father, Lord, I pray, God, that you would guide my words this morning. Lord, God, uh, uh, guide them to the hearts and to the souls of the people that are in this place. Father God, I ask you, Lord, that you may be honored and glorified in everything that's said and done uh, in this morning's uh, message. And Father, I, I pray for that soul that's lost and undone without you. God, speak to their heart. 
I pray for that soul that's been doubting you. God, speak to their heart this morning. And Father God, let us uh, uh, leave this place saying it's been good to be in your house. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. amen. All right, so this morning in Philippians 2, it says uh, he, he, he admonishes, Paul admonishes the Philippian church uh, to work out their own salvation with fear uh, and trembling. And, uh, and he says to them, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. All right, so it, 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 oftentimes this has been uh, miscombobulated and, and misthought about, about uh, work out your own salvation. Uh, let me tell you something this morning uh, on the authority of God's word. It is by grace that ye are saved. It is not by your works. It is uh, not anything good that you have done. It's not you finding yourself uh, to be worthy of salvation. It is by grace that you are saved. It is not of yourselves. And, uh, and so this morning as we ask, well, if it's by grace, what is it that we've got to work out? And, and this morning, I, I want to uh, uh, extend to you that I believe that it's working out uh, the, the doubts that we sometimes have uh, in, in what God has already done. Okay, and so this morning, I want to say this, uh, and, and I want you to listen closely uh, to the message this morning. There's nobody that if they're being honest, don't have some doubts and fears. There's nobody sitting under the sound of my voice this morning, if they're honest, will not admit that sometimes they doubt things and sometimes they fear things. And uh, I believe it to be a dangerous thing. I, I, I will take it like uh, uh, Charles uh, Haddon Spurgeon said, that, that it is something that... that that we, we take it so lightly to doubt who God is. But listen to me this morning. That's a very serious sin uh, when you start talking about doubt. And, uh, I, and I want you to understand uh, that there's a difference in what I tell you last week. That it's different to be tempted than when you fall into that temptation. It, it, it's not a sin to be tempted to doubt, but it's a sin when you fall into that doubt. And, uh, and when you fall into that doubt, it, it becomes a lifestyle. It becomes uh, how you walk and how you live your Christian life. And, and, and church, that's no way to do it. And I, I'm not here this morning to make any of you doubt your salvation. I, but I'm going to tell you this morning that if you doubt your salvation, you can get that fixed in this place this morning. Uh, I, I want to recall to you the, the story of a good friend of mine. I, I was raised up in church with him. I was in youth group with him. He is now a pastor uh, uh, not very far from here. I won't call his name. Uh, but let me, let me tell you about his testimony. Uh, his testimony is that uh, he had went with somebody else uh, uh, when they went to get saved at a Bible school. He, one of his buddies looked over at him and said, I think I'm going to go get saved. How about you? And uh, this young man said, I, I believe I'll just go with you. And, and, and so uh, this young man was raised up in church. He had a, a head knowledge of who Jesus was. And, and, and so when he was asked by his uh, father, who was a pastor, he said, son, uh, what, what happened at Bible school his, his father was away preaching a revival and and he said well daddy I got saved I, I asked Jesus to come into my heart and, uh, and and he answered all the questions correctly and uh, he was later he was uh, about nine years old he was uh, baptized into the church and uh, uh, and was a member in good standing and uh, anyway long story short you fast forward and he's about uh, 37, 38 years old, and he's sitting in, sun, in, in church one Sunday morning, and the Lord speaks to him, and he says to him, if you don't get saved today, I'm not going to mess with you again. Uh, you're about to walk over your line of grace, and I will no longer uh, speak to you. Uh, that young man said that he went to the altar that morning. His daddy, the pastor, was up uh, preaching. His, his daddy got down there beside us 
of him and said to him, Son, he said, what do you need to pray about this morning? And the boy looked at his daddy and he said to his daddy, he said, Daddy, I need to be saved. And his daddy looked at his son and said, Son, I thought you were saved. And he said, Daddy, I prayed a prayer a long time ago, uh, but I didn't believe all that stuff for, was for real. He said, I, I, I've, I've doubted it for years and years and years. And said, I want to nail down uh, this morning. I want to know uh, that I'm saved. And, and, and so that morning, as a 38-year-old man, uh, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. This was his testimony afterward. Uh, he was the Sunday school superintendent. He was a backup Sunday school teacher. He sang in the choir. Uh, and and uh, he, he was a, a, a man that by all appearances looked like uh, he was on the right track and looked like uh, that he was headed in the right direction. Uh, he said uh, from his own testimony he said I'd done all of those things. He said I was a Sunday school superintendent. Uh, he said said, I, I was a backup Sunday school teacher. He said, I sang in the choir. He said, to beat one more than that, I worked at a gospel radio station. All I heard every day was gospel music playing. And But he said this, he said, had I died, I would have went to hell, and I would have been one of the most religious people down there. Uh, but he said, thank God that I'm saved now, and that I know that I'm saved. Amen. After his uh, salvation experience. It wasn't just a couple of years the Lord called him to preach. And nowadays he's a pastor and it's like I said not very far from here. So this morning I'm telling you that not, I, I'm not here to make you doubt your salvation. I'm here this morning to tell you that if you have doubts, if you have fears, if you've got uh, uh, something going on that you think something's missing and something just ain't right, I don't care this morning how long you've been a member of this church. I don't care how many times you've been in the baptistry. I'm telling you this morning that salvation is a personal a thing that you need to work out between you you and God, and it's got nothing to do with who the pastor is. It's got nothing to do with who baptized you uh, in a baptistry. Hey, let me tell you what uh, so a lot of Baptists, I believe, is going to uh, experience this one day. Uh, they're going to stand up before Jesus Christ. Uh, they're going to say to Jesus, I, 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 I taught Sunday school in your name, and I sung in the choir in your name, and I even went out and, and taught in Bible school in your name. I went out on mission trips in your name and he's going to look at them and he's going to say depart from me for I never knew you so this morning as we as we take this message and I'm telling you uh, that it, don't get mad at me I'm telling you it's dangerous to doubt it's dangerous to doubt I had a, a young a lady, she was in her early 80s. This, this happened uh, several years ago. She's now uh, di died and went on. But I was, I was sitting in a chicken house. I was about 12, 13 years old. And I was sitting in a chicken house gathering eggs. And you have this conveyor belt, and I, I was gathering my eggs, and you're grading my eggs and everything. And I got to singing a song that we sang this morning, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I was over, I was gathering my eggs, and uh, Miss Dorothy McGee was her name. She sat across from me and gathering her sack. And I got to crying because I thought about what a day that's going to be. <laughs> and I get to that part, and y'all, I'm sorry, it just tires me up when he takes me by the hand. Oh, I can just feel it, this, this him slipping his hand up in my hand, and he starts walking me all over uh, glory land. Oh, boy, I'm looking forward to that day. And so I got to cry, and I got uh, 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 to, to, to weep in there and praising the Lord. I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't crying because it hurt. I was crying because I was joyous. And, uh, and, and, and Miss Dorothy, she looked over at me, and she said, how can you know? And I said, because Jesus saved me. That's how I know. 
She said to me, I wish I knew. And I said, Dorothy, if I didn't know, I'd be on my knees in this chicken house making for sure. This lady was raised up holiness, thought she might lose it on her way. Let me tell you something, honey, and I'm going to tell you this just as straight and as plain as you've ever heard it. If you've got it, you ain't going to lose it, amen, uh, because I'm not depending on me to hold on to it. I'm depending on him uh, to hold on to it. All my eggs this morning are in one basket, and that's what Jesus did for me. Amen. I ain't worried about losing it. Because the Bible says no man shall pluck you out of my hand. And not only are you in my hand, but you're in my father's hand. And ain't nobody going to get you out of his hand neither. Amen. No man, well that means me included. I can't even do nothing to get myself out. Amen. Amen. 1 John chapter 5 and verse... 13 there he says these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that you may know number one this morning I want you to know that you can know you can know that you have Jesus as your Savior. You can know beyond a shadow of any doubt that, he, that you're born into his kingdom and born again from above. John wrote the entire book of, the, uh, of 1 John so that way you can know. When there is a knowing, do you know what? There is no wondering. If we got honest this morning, there's folks sitting in this house that wonder where they'd die, if they died, where they'd go. There's folks sitting in this house this morning wondering, it, 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 did I really get it when I, when I thought I got it? There's others in here wondering, what is somebody else going to say uh, if I go up to the altar and give my heart and life to Jesus when they think that I've been saved all these years? Let me tell you something. I wouldn't worry about what anybody else thought. I'd worry about what I knew. Amen. There's no wondering in knowing. There's no worrying in knowing. You don't have to worry about who's got you. You don't have to worry about whether or not you've got something that's going to last. There's no worry in, in knowing. It, you know, there was a, a, a story that I read, and it was a, about uh, a quarterback. And uh, y'all may know him. I, I think his name was Joe Namath. I, I, I believe that's his name. Broadway Joe. Broadway Joe used to say this. He said there was not a ball game that he ever played in that he didn't get butterflies before the ball game. But he said the day after the ball game, they watched the video. They watched the film of the ball game. And he said, I never got butterflies on film day because I knew what had happened. You don't have to worry when you know. There's no worry in there. There's no wishing. I, well, I wish I... I had, listen to me this morning, I, I've heard this and, I, and I've heard folks say, I wish I had what so-and-so has. I wish I could worship the way they worship. I wish I could praise the way they praise. Listen to me this morning. If you know that you've got Jesus at, as your Savior, you've got the same thing that that other person's got. Amen. They ain't wishing you could have what they've got. You've already got what they've got. Amen. Now, you say, Brother John, I just don't get into worship like, like you do. They ain't everybody wired up the same way as I'm wired up, okay? 
But I, I tell you the story, I, that, and I've told this before, and I'm going to tell it again this morning. If y'all get tired of me, you can, uh, if y'all need to go eat, go eat. Here we go. There's a young, uh, uh, an older fella, older gentleman, in, in a church where I used to attend, and, uh, and uh, he was real meek and real quiet and real timid. He, he, he was one of them kind... And, and y'all know how I am. I'm kind of loud and I'm kind of, you know, like in your face, you know, kind of guy. Well, this guy, he wasn't that way. He was real shy and real timid and real meek. And I'd go up and I'd aggravate him, you know, and he's like, you know, it was hard to do to get a grin to crack out of this guy. I'm telling you, it was hard. But one Sunday morning, he sat right in front of me, him and his wife. I'm telling you, the Spirit of God got on in that house. And his hand went up like this right here. Y'all, I like to come unglued. Amen. I like to come unglued because it took a whole lot to get his hand right there. I knew how shy, how timid, and, and, and all that, and how backward he was. And he took his hand, and he put it up right there. And y'all, I was right behind him, and I just got unglued because the Holy Spirit that had dealt with him was now dealing with me. And I'm telling you, we're not all wired just alike. But if you've got Jesus as your Savior, you don't have to wish of what somebody else has got. You've already got that. He's living inside of you. The Holy Ghost of God, he, He's living in there. And He'll put a tear in your face sometimes. So every now and again, He'll make you stomp your feet. You might get all spastic like I do sometimes. But it doesn't matter. As long as you're worshiping our Savior. Amen. Because of what you know, of who you know. It's not something you got to wonder about. It's not something you got to worry about. And it's not something you got to wish for. You can know, is what John tells us here. He said, I wrote these things that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know. Next part of that verse, it says that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know that it's yours. And when we talk about eternal life, most of us conjure up these images of heaven. We, we get in our minds, and y'all, I'm looking forward to the day uh, when I walk on streets of gold. I'm looking forward to seeing the pearly gates. I'm, I, I'm looking forward to, to seeing those that have gone on before me. I'm praising God this morning. I'm looking forward to that day. But that ain't got nothing to do with eternal life. Eternal life is not something that begins the moment you die physically. Y'all ain't with me. I said something about eating and half of you left in your mind. <laughs> Eternal life is not something that you obtain when you physically die. It is something that is given you when you're spiritually born. Amen. So you have eternal life. Do you get what I'm saying to you? It's not something that we're going to get when we die. It's something we've already got. It is now in our personal possession. Eternal life. If you know that Jesus is your Savior, then right now in your personal possession, you have eternal life. The problem is, is what are we doing with the eternal life we've got? What are we doing with the eternal life we've got? It's not a matter of when we get it. When we get it is when we're saved. And if you know this morning that you're saved, you've already got eternal life. But if we are truly living... The eternal life, we are concerned with eternal things. Not worldly or temporal things. 
You get what I'm saying to you? I see it. I already got it. But if I'm, if I'm living the eternal life, I'm concerned with eternal, eternal things, not temporal things. Did y'all know, and I know you think I'm jumping off track this morning, but did y'all know that England is, or Great Britain or the UK or whatever they call themselves these days is about to get a new prime minister? They're about to elect a new prime minister. Do you know, I'm not at all concerned about that. Because that ain't where I live. Same thing with eternal and temporal. If you're living the eternal life, you're, you're not concerned with the temporary things. If you're living the eternal life, you're concerned with the eternal things. Because that's where you're living. Amen? But so many Christians today are not living the eternal life. They're, they're, they, they think, man, I'll get my eternal life when I die and go to heaven. And, and, and I got that sealed and I got that uh, settled on a day. And, and, and I'm going to get my eternal life then. Right now, I'm going to live for me. That's how many, so many Christians are today. That's why the church is in the sorry shape that it's in. Is because nobody's living the eternal life. They're living a temporary life when, when he wants you to know that it's yours. Well, who should we be concerned with if we're living the eternal life? The condemned. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the only begotten of the, of the Father. We should be concerned with the condemned. We, sh we should be also concerned with the church because the current condition of the church is in sad shape. On... And I'm not throwing any, any particular denomination or anything else like that under the bus this morning. But do you know what will pass for a church nowadays? Ain't it all what Christ died for? for? Amen. Amen. It's become more of a social gathering and, and, and more of a time where we go to see uh, uh, who's got what on and see how much money we can raise and see how much good uh, we can do. I'm telling you this morning that the church of Almighty God was established by Jesus Christ in order to be His hands and feet in this world. It was not about how be, uh, big a building we could uh, build. It is not about how, be, uh, how nice of facilities we can have. It is about seeing lost souls born into the kingdom of God and it's about seeing those souls being discipled in the word of God so that way they can go out and share the word uh, with other folks that are condemned Amen. the condemned and the church should be our main focus and our main concern but here's what we're concerned with me what I want how I want it and very seldom, if you, if you took a poll and people were honest, and you say, what's the main concern you have in your life right now? If I went over to these teenagers and I said, what's your main concern that you have in your life right now? Some of them would say, well, school starts in a couple of weeks. Others might say, well, worried about seeing if I can get me a boyfriend or get me a girlfriend. Might, might if they look a little longer term, I'm wondering where I'm going to go to college. I, I'm, I'm thinking about who I'm going to marry. And then you, you get on back to the, the, the middle-aged crowd, and they're concerned with, well, i got to work tomorrow. Or I'm trying to get this new job with this better promotion or it's got more vacation days or I'm worried about my 401k. I, I'm worried about what, the day that I retire. And y'all, that's just in the church. If we, if we got honest and we said, what concerns you? The direction the church is headed ought to be high up on our list. 
of, man, I, I want to see God do something awesome and something mighty and something great. And, and, and I want that up there. But, but the problem is, is we're not living for the eternal. We're living for the temporal. But yet John says, I want you to know that it is yours. Amen. Listen. It, it's not only should we be concerned with the condemned and concerned with the church. We should be concerned with the Christ. And when I say that, I say that with all... And, and you think, well, John, you just got a bunch of C's and put them together. If we're not concerned with pleasing Christ, then you know who we're concerned with pleasing? Us. And when, when has this ever been about us? Well, if you, you, you meet folks, they say, well, I, I, I want this, 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 and this in the church. How many of those, well, I can add this, 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 and this if I join this church because I'm willing to do what Christ is wanting me to do? Amen? Folks will say, have you got something for the kids? Folks will say, well, you got a wish, you know. Yeah. But it's not about us. Amen. It's about Christ and about Him being pleased with us. Because if we don't do, not do something for our kids and reach to our kids, then we're going to lose a whole other generation. But it's not about the kids. It's about the Christ. Amen. And when it becomes more about the kids than about the Christ, then you know what? We've lost it. We've lost our very purpose for being here. We should be concerned. If we look at the, the eternal things, we should be concerned with the condemned. We should be concerned with the church. We should be uh, concerned with the Christ. But we should also be concerned with the conviction. And here's where it's going to get hairy and ugly, and y'all just not going to like me no more, but that's all right, too. Y'all go from liking me to not liking me to liking me to not liking me and just all in one sermon, and I, and I love it. <laughs> but we've got so many that are so fickle today that if, if, if Brother Josh or Brother John or whoever else is standing in the pulpit stomps their toes a little bit and they get a little bit convicted, they'll say, well, I don't like that. I ain't going back there. They're not going to talk to me like that. Instead of letting the Spirit of God do the convicting on their heart and because He's trying to change them more into the image of Christ, so we're, they're more concerned about the church and the condemned. And that's what the conviction's all about. This morning, I'm telling you, it is, it is from the bottom of my heart, if I stomp your toes or kick your shins or you leave here bloody, that's because I've missed. I've not got a good aim. I'm aiming at your heart. I'm aiming at your soul. I'm aiming at your mind. So that way you'll say, I want to be what Christ would have me to be. Not concerned with what preacher John wants. Not concerned with what Pastor Josh wants. Not uh, worried about what the Sunday school teacher wants. But I want to be what Christ wants me to be. Amen. And now I'm going to tell you something. That is all about Holy Ghost conviction and nothing else. That's right. Because Holy Ghost conviction is what will come in and what will change you from the inside out. I might be able, listen to me, I might be able to, to change you for a little while and make, make you go the direction I want you to go. I might be able to do that. But you know what? If the Holy Ghost gets a hold of you, He can change you from now to all of eternity. He can change the way you look at the stuff. He can change your focus. We ought to be concerned about that conviction, being able to be free in the place and not somebody come in and get puffed up and mad uh, because the preacher preached right on me. Amen. Amen. Last time I checked, you didn't get to shoot the postman whenever he brought you bills and you didn't like the bills. Amen. Amen. Why do you want to get mad at the preacher? Then they go somewhere else and they'll get mad at that preacher too. 
I just say it like it is. <laughs> you know why the condition of the church is in the shape that it's in? It's because there's too many doubts and too many living for the temporal and not the eternal. next part of the verse it says that ye may know that ye have eternal life and ye, that you may believe on the name of the son of God now wait a minute brother John is so that way they will believe no first part of the verse he says you, he's writing these things that that believe that already believe but the second part of this that ye may believe it, it, it's, it's kind of like this I'm going to reiterate something that you, that you already know. I, I'm going to tell you this so that way it, it, it gets sealed and settled in your spirit. And this is, this is what needs to get sealed and settled in your spirit. That it is only by Him. It is only by Him that you already have eternal life. It's only by Him that you can know. It is only by Him. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. It is only by Him. It's only by His grace that you're here this morning. It's only by His blood that you're saved this morning. It's only by His life that He was able to save you uh, through His death because His life was perfect and, 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 and without sin and He was the perfect Lamb that laid down on a cross and gave His life for us. It, it was only by Him. It was only by His grace. It was only uh, by His life. It was only by His death that any of us are sitting here this morning and that we can know that we have eternal life it's only by him Amen. it's only by his resurrection that we got hope for tomorrow it's only by his intercession that we've got hope for today amen you don't have to doubt that you do not have to doubt that. As a matter of fact, church, listen to me this morning. It's dangerous to doubt. It's a dangerous thing when you walk down the road of doubt and you and you decide, uh, man, I, I'm, 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 I, I just don't know about all of this Christianity stuff. I just don't know if Christ's really able to forgive me. I just don't know if God's able to forgive me. I just don't know uh, if, if He's able to wash my sins away. I just don't know if, if I'm, I'm, I've been made a fit subject for heaven. Do you know how dangerous that is? You're calling God out. You're calling God a liar. You're calling God a liar if you doubt that he can save you. You're calling God a liar if you doubt that your sins have been forgiven you. You're saying, well, he, he done it for everybody else, but he can't do it for me. I'm telling you this morning, I don't care uh, what kind of uh, drug you've been on. I don't care what kind of bottle you've been in. I'm telling you this morning that Jesus Christ and Him alone can save you. It's only by Him. Amen. It's only by Him. Don't ever doubt that. I made a comment yesterday on the Facebook. And it's something I'd heard and I, I probably didn't quote it right, but it's something that I'd heard in the past. And, and in preparation for this message, I put this on there, and I'm going to read it to you this morning. Either Christ is who he says he is, and who the Bible says he is, or he is the biggest liar to ever live. And the Bible is the most elaborate hoax that humanity has ever known. Well, have you got any doubts this morning? Because either Jesus is who he says he was or who he says he is. Either he has the ability to save you or he don't. Either... That or you, 
you go in the totally opposite direction because I'm telling you, church, this morning, the days of half-hearted, half-believism is gone. It's time you get on. Joshua says, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. But he says, it's for me and for my house, we're going to serve God. Amen. 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 Deciding time is on. There either is no doubt in your mind about who Jesus is, or that's all you do is doubt. You doubt why you're here. You doubt what God can do. You know, I'm, I'm going to just go out here on the limb, and I'm going to say something to y'all. I pray, I, and I pray this often. It's not just something, I, I, and I think I let it out in the, out of the bag the other night in, in, on Wednesday night. But I said, God, send revival. And I pray this often. And I said, God, send it here. Because we're, 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 we're your children, too. And God, I want to see it. I want to see you move like you've never moved before. And why not here? Amen. I'll tell you why not here. There's too many doubts floating around. People doubt God can do it. People doubt God will do it. People doubt God wants to do that. I believe with all my heart, Brother Ryan, that God wants to send the greatest revival that Guest Baptist Church has ever known. He wants to save folks out in the parking lot because they ain't room at the altar. He's wanting to do those things. God is wanting. He's up there. He's willing. But are we ready? But we get these doubts in our mind. And if God, I'm telling you this morning, if God didn't send you this message, He sent it for somebody. Amen. There are those in this house this morning that have been doubting their salvation. They don't know for sure, for sure, that they're saved. You can't lead anybody to the Lord if you don't know Him yourself. You can't help anybody to Jesus if you don't know for a fact that you've got him. You can't sell what you don't own. But there's others sitting in here that has been doubting. Maybe not their salvation, but they've been, they've been doubting God's goodness. Because right now their life is real bad. Let me tell you something. I don't know and I don't pretend to know what you're going through. I don't know how bad it's got around your house. But I'm telling you that in spite of how bad everything is, and if you've lost your job, if your wife's about to leave you, if, 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 if all of these things, God is still good. Amen. And don't you forget. And don't you for one second doubt it. So this morning I asked you to calm your doubts. I asked you to calm your fears in this altar this morning. All I can do is preach it as the Lord gives me utterance. All I can do is give you what God's given me. It is up to you to do something with it. If you... This morning, have got doubts. If you've got fears, I beg of you, do not leave this place doing that such a dangerous thing. Play me a song, Wade. Y'all stand to your feet.